Welcome to the Crossboard Interviews with Chris Brown. I'm your host, Chris Brown. And if you listen to Friday's episode, as this is coming out on Tuesday, you know that our regular uh, regular guest, Sarah Biggs of Point of Order, our live weekly Wednesday show, is off working on a leadership campaign, so she cannot talk about the UCP leadership. So I needed someone to come in and talk about UCP leadership and Alberta politics in a little bit more in-depth, off the record, well, on the record, off the record, conversation. And I thought, who better than our guest from way back in January, Mr. Dave Cornier, of the Dave Berta Substack website, former podcast. Dave, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor and a pleasure as always. Well, it's it's uh, <laughs> it's a, it's, an, it's an honor. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh for having me back, Chris, this is, uh, I always love talking about, I always love talking about politics. So anytime I can uh, exactly. get a, get a, a podcast or a platform to talk about Alberta politics, we can just go on for hours. So hey. I'm not sure your, your listeners will be here in hours, hours from now. <laughs> hey, who knows? Who knows? But um, as I said, beginning, we are going to be talking about the UCP leadership because uh, the rules came out, the price tag came out to enter the rules around when memberships can be sold, the rules around when, uh voting would be taking place came out uh, i gotta start off with the million dollar question were you surprised at the hefty price tag of hundred and fifty thousand dollar entrance fee and a twenty five thousand dollar non-refundable goodwill don't do anything stupid during the campaign fee <laughs> It's a, a good behavior fee, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a good behavior deposit. Yeah, no, it's a steep, uh, it's a steep entry fee, and we don't usually see them this high in provincial politics. I know in the the last UCP leadership race, it, I think it was ninety five thousand dollars was the was the entry fee. Um, One hundred and fifty thousand dollars plus another twenty five thousand dollar deposit is that's a lot of money for. Um, it's just a gen in general a lot of money, um, and I think it's meant to weed out candidates who, you know, might not be too serious um, or, you know, might, might not be able to raise that type of raise that type of money. Cause there are a lot of candidates where, you know, who might not might, who might be, you know, legitimate candidates in terms of they have interesting things to say um, and they contribute to the race, but you know, if they can't raise that money, they can't, uh, they can't have a spot at the, uh, at the, at the debate podium and they can't have a spot on the ballot. And the timeline that they actually have to pay the fees as well, because we're coming up to July 12, which is less than a month away as of recording this. And that's when the first $50,000 is potentially needed to be deposited. Um, if I was a candidate, would I have already put my name in the ring to potentially even consider putting it out? Because we hear some feelers from people like Jason Nixon, people like Michelle Rempel Gardner. Uh, I think there was uh, Drew Barnes has said that he's thinking about it. Is this trying to weed out, okay, we already have eight. If we get to 12, this is going to be a gong show of epic proportions, similar to the 2017 federal conservative leadership race where everyone and their mother seemed like they ran? Well, I mean, it can still be a gong show with four, <laughs> with four or five candidates. Um, <laughs> True. I, I th- I, yeah, I think the first, I mean, I, 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 I don't think that the candidates will have much of a problem. Most of them will have much of a problem uh, you know, raising the first fifty thousand dollars, doing the first couple installments. I think when you get closer to the final deadlines, and you'll start to get a. I mean, the candidates will start to will have a better idea of where they are in terms of fundraising, and also the candidates will have a better idea of where they are for membership sales. Mm-hmm. So you know, the, the, it's a crowded race right now, but you know, we're going to start to see, and you can kind of see it right. You can kind of see the different kind of tiers of candidates r- right now as the race is starting, but. As it goes on over the summer, we're going to start to get a better idea of who the who the front runners are, who the you know the the second place or the second tier candidates are, and and that's when the when the you know and if they do stay in the race and if they are able to make those uh, the make those uh, those um, uh, 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 entry fee deadlines, um, you know we'll start you'll start to have some discussion around well whose second place votes go to who right because it's a preferential ballot so it's a first it, I'm, I'm Excuse me if I'm skipping ahead in the in our our discussion about this, but it's a one member one vote yeah um, race, right? So, but it's a preferential ballot. So when uh, when a uh, a member goes to vote, whether they go vote in person or they vote through the mail, they're going to choose their first, second, third, fourth candidates, and then the 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 candidates with the you know the least amount will get knocked off, and then their votes will be redistributed until one of the candidates gets more than fifty percent of the vote. 
and this is the same way that the federal conservatives actually vote as well. It's sort of a cousins are working together here because I was I was at the Brian Jean event in Calgary last week, and uh, I was talking to one of his organizers, and they were saying basically what they did was took the rules from the federal leadership and they just like copied and pasted and put it into the provincial leadership race. So this, if you're looking at the federal race, it's the exact same, but a little bit scaled down for memberships and timeline compared to the federal mm -hmm. one that started a few months and, ago. And and no point system, right? Oh, thank God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank God. This is, I, just a, this is just a one member, one vote. So yeah. it'll, it'll be interesting to see where, where the memberships are sold. I mean, we saw in the, in the UCP leadership review that happened last month, um, there was uh, a membership list that was leaked. I think it was to CBC. Jason Marcus off wrote, wrote an article about it, and they had a uh, uh, a really an interactive map that showed you know with the ridings of the province, and you could see where the most members of the UCP were. And it was a very rural dominated, rural heavy membership vote or membership vote uh, in the UCP leadership race, and and not as much in in the urban areas, which which was surprising because when you go back to the old the days of the old Progressive Conservative Party. Uh, you know, the PCs would sign up a ton of members in rural Alberta, Alberta, but they'd also sign up a ton of members in the, in the urban writings too. So, you know, who shows up to vote uh, and, and, you know, who, who the, who the membership base of the UCP is in this, this leadership race will, will, uh, will define, we will, no, no, you know, no surprise, we'll define what the outcome is, but it'll be interesting to see who exactly is voting and who's Be participating in this race. Before we talk about the candidates here a little bit more in depth, I, I, I've, been, I've been pondering a question that I've been trying to get someone to answer for me, and hopefully you, being the guy who's followed Alberta politics for a long period of time, can answer this. Jason Kenney won the, technically he won the leadership review with 51.44%. He resigned. Does this give the next leader of the UCP a goal to beat that 51.4% in this vote that is coming up in October? Because if I'm a leader and I'm going in and if I get 51.2%, less than what Jason Kenney got, and he says he has no mandate to govern, does this not put a target on these uh, candidates back to say, I need to get 60 or higher or I'm screwed going in because we're still a fractured caucus? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think <laughs> that I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, that's a uh, uh, that would be kind of a. It might be. I mean, people with the, the chattering class, people would definitely be talking about it if if the if the winner and got fifty one point four or less than fifty one point four percent of the vote on in, on the uh, on the final ballot. Um, I mean, I think if you're you know if you're running in this leadership race, you're running to to win no matter what, and fifty percent plus one in in this context yeah. means that they become the next leader and the next premier. But you know, having a decisive win is definitely something that that uh, that would quash those kind of uh, that that kind of commentary and and quash questions about whether the whether the UCP is uh, is you actually a united conservative party or not. But but the more people you get on the ballot, the you know the harder to harder it's going to be to kind of win decisively like that. Um, uh, especially if there's kind of two or three really strong candidates and the and their second place votes votes are all kind of split all over the place. It there is a lot of unknown candidates in this race. Um, and I, I say that, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a few seconds here, but um, in the federal leadership race, you have four people who are relatively known besides Roman Babber. Let's just leave Roman off the table here for a second. You have Leslie Lewis, you have Patrick Brown, John Charest, and Pierre Polyev. Scott Aitchinson, okay, Atkinson, however you pronounce his last name, he's he might be well known in Perry Sound, Muskoka, not outside of that. In this race, you have uh, Daniel Smith, you have Brian Jean, and I would say Travis Taves, but even then, I don't think most people, besides the political geeks like yourself and I, would know who the Minister of Finance was under Jason Kenney or who the Minister of Finance was under Ralph Klein during his first term. The, usually in provincial politics, you worry about who the premier is, and that's about it. Um, does that level the playing field a bit in this in this upcoming leadership race where you have a Rebecca Schultz, you have a Rajon Swanee, you have Bill Rock, still don't know what he looks like, but mayor of a small town here in Alberta, Todd Lowen, you kind of know who he is. Does this level the playing field when it comes to an open field? Because Pierre Pauly have announced federally, he sort of took the wind out. You have these candidates in this UCP leadership race. There's not a lot of name recognition when it comes to who these people are outside of UCP circles. 
Yeah, you know, I saw a poll or, or uh, uh, results of a poll that came out yesterday or the day before. It was I can't remember which polling company did it, but they were polling the general public on name recognition. It was it was who would you support or, or who would you who do you think would be the best next leader of the UCP? But really, I think what it was gauging was ended up gauging was name recognition because the two hot the two top names, I think 20, around 23 or 26 percent each was was uh, Danielle Smith and Brian Jean. And those are two recognizable names they've been, but they've both been leaders of the Wild Rose Party in the past, both been leaders of the Wild Rose official opposition, um, you know, and had been MLAs. And Danielle Smith has profiled through her radio pro, former radio program and as a uh, host on uh, on global in years past. And, and Brian Jean has been around for a long time as a member of parliament. And, and you know, this ongoing fight with uh, with Jason Kenney, he's been getting quite a bit of me, quite a bit of media attention over the past couple of years. Um, you know, the the other names were quite a bit lower. Travis Taves, I think, was around 12 or 13 percent. And then, you know, the other names were single digits because the general public doesn't really recognize them. But this isn't a race for the this, this isn't a race of the general for, for the general public. This is a race to sign up members for the for um, to vote in a party leadership race. So, um, you know, I mean, name recognition is can be a double edged sword, I would say, especially with someone like Danielle Smith. Uh, you know, there's a lot of people who remember what she did in December 2014 when she crossed the floor to the from the Wild Rose to the Progressive Conservatives and led uh, seven or eight of her MLAs to go with her. And and you know, there's a lot of real there's a lot of bitterness that still exists out there. And and you know, people don't necessarily don't necessarily forget that. So I'd say name recognition can be a bit of a double edged sword. Um, but uh, but when it comes to uh, um, uh, you know selling memberships, you know, I mean, it's looking at you know who's when you're looking at a leadership race, who's holding, who's, who has endorsements from MLAs, who's getting, you know, key supporters from inside the party, who's, you know, if, if there's community supporters who are going out and selling memberships, um, you know, who's holding big rallies or events. I mean, I saw Rajan Sani uh, held a, um, a rally in Calgary, and I'm told there were six or 700 people there. I know. I, I, can, confir- I can confirm that yeah. because I was there and it was, it start. it was supposed to start at six and then people slowly started showing up. If you know Northeast politics, Northeast Calgary politics, you know, when something says it starts at six, it actually means 645. So there you go. <laughs> Um, and uh, and Travis Taves is having a rally at the uh, River Cree um, Hotel at uh, at the Enoch at Enoch um, west of Edmonton, I think next week. So you know we'll start to see kind of okay, well who's you know who has establishment support, who looks like they're getting people interested in them. I mean, it, it's it's kind of hard. It's hard to gauge at, at this point because it is such a kind of a, I don't want to say an open. I mean, it is an open race, um, and there's so many unknowns, and we don't know whether candidates like Michelle Rempel Garner are going to join the race um, or, I mean, there, there could be others who, who decide who decide to jump in as well. So <laughs> who knows, but with it, with everything, the way that it's going right now, who's going to join this race. I, I, I want to talk about uh, the, the unknowns in this race right now, because there are, like you said, many who's going to come in, who's going to drop out before that first ballot is even printed to get sent out to uh, get people to vote. What is the biggest unknown in your, uh, in your opinion right now facing this leadership race? Is it the short time frame? Is it the unknown who's going to enter? Is it the unknown who's going to be on the ballot? What is the unknown that you're watching in this race right now? Well, I mean, I think the just just to kind of address the, the the three things the three three unknowns that you brought up. I mean, I think that you know the short time frame time frame and the the very early cutoff uh, for membership sales, which I think is August twelfth, which is super early because the lead the the actual leadership vote. I mean, it's it's a it can be a mail in vote or it can be an in person vote, but they're not announcing the new leader until October sixth. So having a you know this is this avoids the the situation that the old Progressive Conservative Party. From found itself in in uh, in all of its leadership races going back to 1992, is you had these kind of what, what were people who were coined as two minute Tories, basically people who could, you know, go go to the voting station on voting day, buy a PC party membership, and five minutes later vote in the leadership race. Um, and we saw, I mean, Ralph Klein that helped Ralph Klein in 1992 on the second ballot. It it was the reason why Allison Redford defeated Gary Marr. It was the reason why Ed Stelmack defeated Jim Dinning in, in 2006. Um, this the leadership rules that the UCP has created isolate. Kind of, I think they're designed to isolate the 
party establishment from that sort of phenomenon to have this, whereas the PC party used to make, PC party supporters used to make this argument back, uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago that the, the leadership race was the real election because the PC party had such a hold electorally. There wasn't a competitive opposition party that this was the, this was the way Albertans could directly choose the next premier of Alberta. And it was the most democratic way. And, and it was the real election. And I mean, I, roll my eyes thinking about it but but that was that was the argument and and legitimately like that was kind of it was kind of true at the time um but it's not true now uh and you know the ucp is you know they're they're not the pc party of of the days your and of your and uh and their leadership race is designed to to i would argue protect uh estab protect establishment candidates from this kind of uh insurgence um the other unknown that I want to talk about is the candidates. We we we, yeah. we still don't know what the field is going to look like, right? We currently have eight, which we're going to talk about later on, but there are names that are speculated to come out. If a big name like a Michelle Rempel Gardner, which uh, lover or hater, because I know if you listen to Twitter, everyone seems to have an opinion on uh, Michelle Rempel Gardner. Does that clear the field of some of these candidates or does it just add a, another person into the ever-growing list of candidates who have put their name forward for this uh, position i think it adds another it adds <laughs> another person so it doesn't uh, until, it doesn't clear the field at all you don't think not not yet i mean i think we'll start to see the fee i mean you might have a candidate or two drop out ahead of the the fee deadlines um you know but i think until you start you know i mean i think you'll see the candidates go through the first and second uh dead you know fee deadlines and then you know you may see them drop out you know before before the final uh the final um uh the final fees are due uh, and final entry fees are due because they just it's not either they can't raise enough money to pay the fees and run a credible leadership race or they just look at the writing on the wall and they say well i'm going to place eight in a race of nine um do i really want to be that person who, you know, do, do I really want to want to be that person or do I want to bow out and potentially endorse someone who could be the next, who could win and be the next premier and, and get in their good graces that way. Um, so there's a bit of, you know, positioning, positioning that way and, you know, and hand over your membership lists and hand over, try to, you know, conv try to convince your supporters to support them. Um, so you could see that, especially if the race gets top heavy, if there are like four or five kind of front runner candidates, um, which, which there could potentially be in this race. It's like you said, it's still, there's still, there's still a lot of, a lot of unknowns and it is crowded and, you know, we have no, re you know, there's, we'll go through the, I mean, you said we'll go through the candidates yeah. in, in, in a, later in the podcast, but, you know, going through the list, there's a few who are, you know, I could see being front runners or I could potentially see being the next premier. But there's and there no, are a few who are front runners who who you know who I could also not see being the next premier as well. So there's no Pierre in this race, is there? Though? No, and that's no, I don't go ahead. Yeah, no, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, I there. I mean, there's no one who's really captured people's attention like Pierre Polyev has or Polyver. I think that's what he calls himself. Um, uh, has on the federal level. I mean, with you know these punchy social media uh, videos, you know, kind of really keying it really really keying in on on issues that that uh, that that are on people's mind in a way that uh you know aggressively in a way that no other politician is doing um i don't see that in this race yet um and i don't know if we will it's a different kind of race because i mean this is these these people are running to be the leader of a party that has been floundering for the past two years that has been um, you know, down in the polls, down in fundraising, and that has ha is, is has just kicked out, for all intents and purposes, a very unpopular leader, um, who is also its founder. Um, so there's a you know there's a bit of a different dynamic. If they were running against, um, you know, if if the NDP were in government, uh, I think you'd you'd hear a lot of more about you know these candidates would position themselves about it, like they are running against Premier Rachel Notley. Um, we've heard a little bit of that in from uh, from Brian Jean talking about how the you know the, he's the only one who can stop the NDP from forming government. But um, you know they're they're kind of they're running from their own legacy uh, in a way, and are running from the the policies that uh, that they all supported for the most, not all of them, but most of them supported uh, that ended up leading to their party being so unpopular. So you know, and they're also running against the person who's currently in the job. Uh, which is which who is also part of their party so there's there's are all sorts of weird dynamics here um so it'll be interesting to see just how loud they are in terms of you know 
of of uh, of criticizing their party and trying to what what they're going to do to uh, to differentiate themselves from from Premier Kenny, especially the the candidates who are former cabinet ministers who up until a week or two ago were sitting around the same cabinet table as him and presumably you know I don't want to say taking orders but you know. Uh, implementing the agenda that he's he's been championing, championing. going out and selling those agendas, those lockdown measures. Uh, I, yeah. I I went to the majority of the announcements that happened in Calgary. I think I missed one, just because I, I missed the date and the press release. Um, not one candidate spoke about Jason Kenney. Did not mention his name. Did not even utter the name, did not even think about saying the name. And it wasn't until after when we actually had the scrums with the media that the name came out, but it was like, we're like ripping a tooth out because they didn't want to actually say his name because they wanted to stay as far away as possible from him. Mm -hmm. Are we going to see a race where Jason Kenny is a non-factor in a race to replace Jason Kenny? <laughs> uh, I think there'll be some candidates who do try to make it a factor. I mean, I, you know, the party's kind of, kind of trying to run away from him and it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how that, how successful that is. And, and I mean, one of, one of the, I, I talk about the old, the old, go back to talk about the old PC party again, but one of like, one of the, the keys to the success of the old PC party, they had like a remarkable self-preservation instinct and like it helped them hold on to majority government power in this province for 43 straight years, uninterrupted, which is, you know, a huge political accomplishment. They became, they became the natural governing party, but they were able to, but they, they weren't the same party as they started out with. They were able to reinvent themselves every time they they had a new leader. So when Peter Lougheed was in, in the in the mid early mid 80s, when he was getting a little long in the tooth, the economy wasn't doing so well, people were getting grumpy because of oil prices uh, and the recession, the party reinvented itself under Don Getty. Um, that, you know, they were able to maintain their maintain their majorities. It didn't go as spectacularly under Getty as it did under Lougheed, but, you know, reached the point a number of years later, Don Getty was also unpopular. So the, you know, he was, he resigned slash was pushed out um and uh and they chose ralph klein who totally reinvented the wheel and the ralph klein's progressive conservative conservative party was very different it was a very different political beast than don getty's party and and peter lawhey's party and you saw this you see this this was this happened again under stelmack happened again under under allison redford and then you know they finally lost their juice and uh, and couldn't do it again and you know the magic spark was gone when uh, when jim prentice finally became premier and, uh, and they weren't able to reinvent themselves again. But, you know, 43 years being able to do that is, is you know, again and again and again is a, is a pretty remarkable political achievement. Now, it'll be very interesting to see whether the UCP can do that. Now, you know, the, the political environment is pretty different now than it would have been under the old PCs. You have a official opposition leader who is a former premier who's running, leading her party into the next election and has been doing very well in the polls and very well in fundraising. That is very different than any other case. I mean, the last, uh, you know, the last, I mean, they've never, I don't think we've ever had a former premier run in this province, lead a party into another election after they lost the previous election. I mean, Harry Strom resigned yep. when, uh, when the PC party won in 71 and Jim Prentice resigned, as we all know, on election night in, in 2015. So, um, you know, it's having, you know, you're going to have to find someone who, uh, you know, who, who, uh, you know, can can play can reinvent the, the, the reinvent what it means to be a UCP government in in uh, in that kind of electoral dynamic where you do have an opposition leader who's who is who can walk into the premier's office and be premier tomorrow because she's done it before and does have MLAs in the legislature who have been cabinet ministers before and will know how to do it again. This isn't like 2015 where the NDP walked in and you know didn't know any of the passwords and didn't know where the washrooms were and you know but you know because it was such a shock that they yeah. won. Um, you know, these are people who have been cabinet ministers before and, and can be cabinet ministers and might be cabinet ministers again. So, you know, it's it, we're the mold is broken in Alberta. And, uh, you know, we it's a it's a we are this new electorally competitive environment with that uh, that hasn't really existed before. And I mean, you know, it's existed since 2015, but it's, it's still something we got to we're, we're getting used to in Alberta. And, and I think even the, our, our politicians aren't really used to it. Conservatives in Alberta aren't used to being, having challenge. to face like real challenge and real uh, electoral competition. I mean, outside of Edmonton and, you know, Northeast Calgary and Central Calgary, like it's it's usually a slam dunk, but it's not anymore. You, you mentioned- and it's, not, and it's not gonna be for the next UCP leader either. 
No, you mentioned a premier that has been spoken more times in at uh, leadership uh, launches than I thought I would ever hear, and that is Ralph Klein. Ralph Klein is on everyone's mind right now. Um, when you talk to people in the audience, they say, I, I'm looking for the next Ralph Klein. Why does Ralph Klein still hold such a godlike status, a deity status in conservative politics in this province? I, I don't think it's just unique to conservative politics. I think it's just, it's, 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 it's like, it's an Alberta wide phenomenon. I mean, Ralph Klein had, was able to, uh, you know, for all his faults and he did have them and he was mostly upfront with them, which was kind of part of his personality. Um, you know, he was able to appeal to a real broad cross-section of Albertans, you know, from, you know, geographically across the province, you know, so, so you can socioeconomically, you know, from, uh, you know, across, across the spectrum. Um, and, it, you know, a lot of it had to do with his, with his personality or the character that he created as Ralph Klein, as, you know, he was known as he was a, you know, a, a reporter in Calgary. He was mayor of Calgary during a time, you know, where, where, you know, Calgary had gone through some hard times and, and uh, he was able to lead them through, you know, some pretty exciting times through the uh, 1988 Olympics. And I know a lot of people have really fond memories of that. And, you know, when he entered the, you know, when he became uh, a, a cabinet minister, when he, you know, ran in the leadership race in, 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 uh, in 1992, it was very much a, uh, you know, the, the PC party needed to reinvent itself at, at that point. And, you know, it, I was tweeting about it the other day because we've, and this just shows how what a political, giant political nerd I am. We've just passed the 29th anniversary of the 1993 provincial election, folks. Um, which don't was think a close I didn't election. Think, don't think I didn't think of that when I asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, and it was a competitive election. It was, uh, I mean, the, you know, the, the Conservatives won and they won with, I think, 51 seats. But the Liberal Party of all parties um, did very well and almost formed government the, under Lawrence Decor, who was the former mayor of Edmonton. So you had a former mayor of Calgary under with Klein running for the, running the, the uh, um, for the PCs, and you had uh, Lawrence Decor, the former mayor of Edmonton, leading the Liberals. And um, so it was kind of a you know battle of the two cities, and uh, and Ralph Klein prevailed. But it wasn't necessarily always going to be the case. I mean, I think that the changing the leadership was was a big part of it because Don Getty was so unpopular in his final days. And, you know, if you, if you look back at the political commentary and the polling, th there's a good chance. I think there's probably a good chance that the liberals would have won the election if Don Getty had remained leader of the PC party. Um, and imagine that, what a weird, what a strange, or what, what a strange twist that would have been in Alberta politics. If the, if the liberal party had formed government in, in the 1990s in Alberta, <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, Ralph Klein was like a real foil to that. And, uh, um, you know, Lawrence Decor was, he was obviously very successful campaigning against Don Getty and his brand of progressive conservatism, but the PC party was able to reinvent itself and, and they called it the miracle on the prairies is what, uh, is what, uh, what, what it was coined when, when the, uh, the PC party was reelected in 1993, um, and I mean, Ralph Klein reinvented that party in a lot of ways. I mean, he gutted the kind of the old Lougheed Getty establishment. A lot of those old uh, or veteran MLAs were pushed out or pushed out of cabinet or pushed out of their nominations. Um, and he recruited a whole new generation of, of people to, um, uh, to, uh, to join the PC party and join the run as MLAs. And, and, you know, in the nineties, there was a, there was a, he, he led Alberta through a bit of an upswing. And I think people have a, have some, positive uh, recollection of that with the, the price of oil and the price of natural gas um, that, you know, there was an optimism. I mean, obviously there's, that's not how everybody feels about Ralph Klein there. You know, he did some things that had some, I would argue had some pretty disastrous long-term impacts on Alberta in terms of massive cuts to healthcare, massive cuts to education, massive cuts to post-secondary education. And, but um, you know, when, but he really kind of captured that moment around that, 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 it, that really, uh, um, captured. He captured the moment that was that that uh, that had been that had that itself had captured political parties across the politi political spectrum in Canada, which was you know debt reduction and deficit reduction. Well, and you saw in the '90s, New Democrat governments in Saskatchewan slashing the budget and closing hospitals. You had you know conservative governments in Alberta, liberal governments in in Ottawa doing the same thing. So um, he got ahead of the band. I mean, in a lot of ways, he got ahead of the bandwagon and. Uh, and led the parade in that way, but um, but and you know, he, he sparked a conservative movement across the pro of country as well. Because 
with his election, we got Mike Harris in Ottawa. We saw more conservative uh, premiers out in Atlantic Canada. So Ralph Klein was kind of the spark that lit the match that was the conservative movement slash the, like you said, the slash and burn kind of uh, to slash and burn to your budget where we got to keep uh, prices down, which we're not seeing right now. We're seeing the complete opposite. So it mm-hmm. is Ralph Klein is while well, he's an Alberta politician, you talk to Ontarians and I was there a few weeks ago and they, they know who Ralph Klein is. And I mm-hmm. guarantee you, they probably don't know who Ed Stelmack is or Alison <laughs> Redford is. So Ralph Klein is nationally known, I would say. So I agree. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he also won big majority governments mm-hmm. after, after that. So, you know, the, the, after he left the PC party, it was pretty, it was pretty chaotic after that. I, I'd say after the 2001 election, you get into being pretty chaotic. And that was actually, it was, it was uh, um, kind of ironic because that was the, you know, welcome to Ralph's world election. That's where he stood up on stage and, you know, on election night where the PC party had decimated the opposition and, uh, and won, I think 72 or 74 seats out of 83. And, you know, he said, welcome, welcome to Ralph's world. And, uh, you know, that in a way, in a lot of ways, that was kind of the beginning of the end because the uh, the PC party, the PC caucus at that point just became totally unruly because they had too many MLA, too many backbenchers and uh, not enough work for them. So, yeah. you know, you got to keep people busy and give them meaningful work. Otherwise, they're going to cause trouble for the for the leadership or do their own thing. Right. Hence what we see here. Um, last question before we start talking about the candidates, and that is timeline. Um, mm. This race is happening during the summer. I'm not sure about you, but not a lot of people are paying attention to what's happening in the political realm while they're out in Kananaskis, while they're out going to drum heller. This is going to be a very sleeper of an election, a leadership race. And that's just me saying that. That's that's just my observation because you don't capture the people who you want to go out to your rallies to buy memberships. It's harder to do that, particularly when the cutoff is August 12th. Is this going to be a hindrance for the candidates while they're trying to crisscross the province, try to sign up members and try to make sure that they come out and actually sign up? I think, I mean, I think it'll be a hindrance for some candidates. And I think it's, I think in a way it's designed to kind of weed out the less serious candidates or weed weed out the weaker candidates. Um, You know, there's still all of July. There's Calgary Stampede. There's, um, I can't remember when the Pinocchio Stampede is organized is uh, is being held, but there are, you know these there are big events in Alberta within these windows where you know you're going to see conservative can these UCP leadership candidates show up with cowboy hats. You know some of them will look a little more comfortable in cowboy no. hats than others. No. Uh, you know it's it's uh, it's political cosplay season in in, in Alberta. Oh. Um, so there, there there are big events. It is a short timeline, but I think you'll I think you'll end up seeing. Uh, the candidates will hit the barbecue circuit. Um, you'll probably have UCP constituency associations organizing fundraising events for leadership candidates to attend and and uh, and meet members and speak to members. And and the candidates will be holding their own kind of pop up events and and rallies and barbecues around around the province. So I don't know. I think yeah, people go on vacation and people don't really want to pay attention to politics. But I, you know, summers. I think summer's kind of a fine time to 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 hold something like this because people are out, people are outside and and uh, and doing stuff. It's not like uh, it's winter time and you know people don't barely want to leave their houses if it's uh, if it's too cold. Uh, I, I will agree to disagree. I think it's going to be it's going to be what okay. I'm watching That's for. That's fine. <laughs> That's the great thing about yeah, this. Yeah. We can disagree, and I, I just think if, if you want to capture people, like understandable, you don't want to do it in the middle of winter when people are buying Christmas gifts, and it's no matter what time you're going to always have someone like myself who's always yeah. going to be the pessimist in the room saying it's a bad time to do it. Um, but let's talk candidates. Eight candidates have announced. Um, I'm going to go in kind of order as they announced. So that way I can get your, the pros and cons of the candidates. And I'll I'll, I'll throw the name out and you can give me the pros and cons and where you think they they can, are going to probably do better in. And I guess he announced like sort of the day after he lost the last leadership race that he was going to run for a leadership race. And that is Brian Jean. And I Mm -hmm. I mean that with no no disrespect, but it has always been on probably his mind that he was going to run again. Former leader of the Wild Rose uh, Party. He was merged with uh, Jason Kenney's PC party to form the United Conservative Party. He lost. What's his pro in this race? Is it 
I'm not Kenny. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm not Kenny is a pro for uh, anyone for, for for all of the candidates at this at, at at this point. I mean, the you know, I mean, Brian Jean, the the golden boy of Fort McMurray. Uh, you know, he's been running against Jason Kenny since uh, since the uh, the last UCP leadership race, since he lost the last UCP leadership race, and he has a you know he has a grudge. He had he had he had a revenge motive to go after Jason Kenny. I mean, we 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 all know the the RCMP apparently are still investigating the Kamikaze campaign and everything that happened around that. So you know he was you know whether whether or not he would have won the race anyway if it were a fair race. I don't know back in 2017, but I mean I think he was he was legitimately wronged and he had some grievance and and he thinks he can do a better job better job and he returned to politics basically for the sole purpose of of defeating jason kenny and uh and running in this leadership race so his his i mean to get i guess to give him points he's not playing coy his his uh his intent has been clear this whole time um and he obviously was able to help mobilize a lot of ucp members to get out and vote against kenny in the leadership review what will be interesting is whether those members uh will then turn around in October and vote for Brian Jean. Um, you know, he's got name recognition. He's been around Alberta politics. It was, you know, he, he, he didn't almost form government in 2016, but he, he revived the Wild Rose Party in 2015, where when it was sitting on the, uh, on the edge of the abyss after, after Daniel Smith had crossed the floor. So, um, what you know whether he has whether he has a chance, I definitely put him in one of the, as one of the front running candidates. Would you, um, would he be, I, I think I would. Be just for name recognition or just because he he has the backing of kind of the establishment of the wild rose party because uh, i'm assuming that 48.7 percent or 48.6 percent who voted uh for uh ousting jason kenny is probably in the brian gene camp wouldn't it be i I'd, I'd say like probably a lot of them would fit in in like fit comfortably in the brian gene camp i don't know if all of them would i think I mean, it's overstated. Um, it might be a little over. I mean, we overstate what the reasons were why for why people voted against, voted against Jason Kenney in the in the leadership review. There were a lot of reasons. I mean, the 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 reasons that Brian Jean was talking about are, are certain was certainly part of it. But um, and I'd imagine that a lot of them would probably find probably be comfortable. But we're also talking about like in the UC, in the UCP leadership review, review that was a like a, a relatively small number of people compared to some of the leadership races we've seen in this province. I think there was only 30,000 people who ended up voting in the leadership review. I, I would expect, and you know, I, it's a big problem if they don't have more than 30,000 uh, people voting in this, uh, in this leadership race, I would expect it to be higher than, I don't know what the number is, but I would expect it to be higher than 30,000. Um, no. So I, 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 I put Brian Jean in like the top tier candidates. I don't necessarily think I'd, I'd say he's like, I'd, Pin, I wouldn't necessarily pin him as the, the one to win right now, but I think he's up there. So the next person that announced was at the general meeting in Red Deer while Jason Kenney was speaking on stage. She was giving an interview, if I'm not mistaken, to the Western Standard, where she said, <laughs> if Jason Kenney loses, I'm running for the leadership. And that is other former Wild Rose leader, turned yes. progressive conservative MLA, Miss Danielle Smith. Um, she has some baggage that she probably has to deal with. Would would she be considered a front runner even with her baggage? I, I have a hard time. I, th I think Danielle Smith is a serious candidate. Like I think she's taking this seriously, but I I have a hard time seeing her as a front runner candidate in this race, even with her name recognition. I think that there are a lot of conservatives in this province who still, you know, who who will not forget what happened in uh, in. 2014 will not forget the floor crossing and do they blame her for electing an ndp government do you think i think some of them probably do okay um i, I don't think it was you know i think jim prentice had a lot i mean I, she helped create the circumstances the, yeah. the that that helped elect the the ndp government i don't know if she if i don't know if she had still been wild rose leader going into the 2015 or 2016 election if they'd you know respected the the fixed election date <laughs> um you know maybe the ndp would have would would have won anyway i don't i don't know i think that they were in 2015 there was just such a like a unique series of of circumstances you know jim prentice ran a fantastically horrible campaign and rachel notley ran a fantastically excellent campaign and 
you know, there was a mood for time for change and the economy was crashing and people were grumpy and it all kind of just, it was the right magic at the right time. And I don't know if you could, re- I don't know if you could recreate that if Daniel Smith had been the Wild Rose uh, leader at the time, maybe she would have been become premier after that point or, or, uh, or maybe not. Um, but yeah, I, th- and I think she's, you know, following her, her email, new popular email newsletter that she sends out and, you know, her, some of her comments in her final days as, uh, as a host on, uh, on the chorus uh, radio network, I think it, it seemed pretty clear that she's shifted, uh, you know, a little far to the right, pretty far to the right on some, pol- on some political issues. And I think as Wild Rose leader in, in, in her final years, I think she was really trying to position herself as a more moderate conservative and, and, you know, to the, to the angst of her party. And, uh, you know, in, in a lot of ways, it was her own, the, the Wild Rose base that pushed back uh, against her, um, become, you know, trying to position them as a, as a, as a more moderate, uh, conservative political party. So I, I wonder if she, in terms of like the, who, who's voting in the leadership race, I really wonder if she's competing, like if there's like a pool of, of kind of people who fall into the kind of COVID, anti-COVID public health measures, anti-maskers, um, conspiracy theorists types, I wonder if she's competing with other candidates for the same votes. And I'm thinking people like Brian Jean, who's kind of toyed with that, and and uh, and Todd Lowen as well, who um, infamously, uh, at least in some in political circles, took drove his motorhome to Ottawa to join the uh, the convoy slash occupation. Um, do, by having two former leaders of the Wild Rose. Does this hurt both of them at the same time as well? Because that's always what I've been thinking for the last few minutes, the last few days, is having two part, two leaders of the, the once Wild Rose Party. I can't imagine that there's some allegiance to Brian Jean, but there's also allegiance to Danielle Smith. Or is it an open field? And what happened in the Wild Rose happened in the Wild Rose? Uh, is this even something that I should be thinking about? I, you know, I think I think there, you know, there might be. Um, you know, former Wild Rose voters who they know, who they've identified, um, who they're going to go after. But I think Brian Jean in particular, and, and Daniel Smith, I think they really have their own brands, for, for better or for worse, they have their own political brands um, in, in, the, in this conservative, well, in Alberta politics, but in this kind of conservative political world. So, um, yeah, I guess we'll see. Um, you know, I think they, you know, in some ways, they'll, they'll be competing for, for, uh, for similar votes, because they're in talking about the same issues. They're talking about uh, autonomy for Albertans. They're talking about, you know, the sovereignty bill, the sovereign Alberta Sovereignty Act. They're talking about, you know, all these kind of pseudo separatist stuff. I mean, they should just come out and say if they autonomy if they want Alberta, for Albertans. Autonomy oh, for Albertans. There you go. You got the sign behind you. Oh, I mean, if they don't, you know, in, in, especially in Daniel Smith's case, um, you know, proposing this sovereignty act. If, I mean, I, I tweeted this the other day is if if she doesn't want Alberta to be part of Canada, she should just come out and say so. Like none of this kind of like these games toying around saying we want more sovereignty, we want more autonomy. Just like, if you want to be, if you want the Republic of Alberta, then just say you want the Republic of Alberta. But you know, this, we're just going to get, it's, it, it, what this says to me is, you know, these are candidates who are, I mean, they're appealing to a certain voter, you know, and and they're, 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 they're honing in on grievance politics. Um, You know, a, long tradition of grievance politics. Um, but, uh, but when we saw what that, what, what that led to over the past three years, and that's just like lawsuits, you know, the Alberta government paying lawyers, lots of money to go to Ottawa and lose cases. And uh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) The one thing, the one thing I, I I just want to throw this plug in here for a second. The one thing that I, I, I I got a chance to sit down with Brian Jean uh, at his leadership at launch in Calgary here And he said the thing that the next leader of the UCP needs to do is not be a sore winner. I still don't know what that means, but he he says that the leader, the leader can't be a sore winner. I'm not sure if he is speaking of Jason Kenney being a sore winner, but I I, I questioned him and said, are like you being a sore loser about losing the race? He said, I wasn't sore about that. I left (laughs) politics for a reason. So I still don't understand that. And maybe he, Maybe the next leader is not going to be a sore winner, and I just want to shamelessly plug that for a second I, here. Yeah, no, I think I think I think that's a, that that's that's interesting, an interesting comment from Gene, and I think that's probably a good point. I think we could use a dose, and if this is what he means, I think we could probably use a dose of humility in Alberta politics yeah. from our leaderships. And I don't think that 
I mean, humility and Jason Kenny are not two words that I associate with each other. And, and, you know, they, they won a big majority, but, you know, you kept on hearing them talk about how they won a big majority. Um, so maybe that, maybe that's what he means. Um, I, I know I said 45 minutes. Do you have a few more minutes to chat? I do. I do. I do. I do. <laughs> okay. I, I know. I just saw the time. I was like, oh, okay. Okay. Um, we'll try and do these as quick, quickly, quicker though, because then sure. we're, get, we're getting into the lesser known candidates now. And the next one was Bill Rock, mayor of a Ashtrick, if I'm not mistaken. Amisk? Am 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 is that either am Amisk or Amisk? Okay. Um, I didn't know who this gentleman was before he announced. Um, I, I, again, don't know what he looks like. Factor in this race, is he running to say something? Because he's in uh, Nate Horner's riding, Drumheller Stetler. So this is not a riding he's going to potentially run for the nomination. Yeah, I, you know, he, he ran for the Wild Rose Party as their candidate in, as a parachute candidate in 2015 in the Camrose, uh, and Camrose riding. Um, he's, I, I've read, I've read, read, read a couple articles where he's been interviewed. He's, he wants to put rural issues in the spotlight, but I mean, from what I've seen from his social media, he's talking about things like protecting the ability of, uh, protecting the right of police to wear thin blue lion patches and stuff like that. So he's obviously taking a very kind of like, Populist. right wing populist online meme type uh, uh, position. So I don't, I don't necessarily, I don't think he's going to be much of a factor in this campaign. Travis Taves, the former minister of finance under Jason Kenney. He was the sort of the, the, as anyone knows about minister of finance, your, your worst job is saying no to everyone when, especially when they come to you and ask um, he has the backing of 23 MLAs across this province. Um while endorsements may not matter, because if you look at the previous PC leadership races, the person with the most endorsements did not ultimately win, Alison Redford, Ed Stelmack. Um, is Travis Taves too close to Jason Kenney to run an effective campaign against Jason Kenney? This is the, uh, this is the curse of the establishment candidate, right? You, <laughs> yeah. never, you, never, you never want to be the front runner, right? Uh, but it seemed that, I mean, it seems like Taves is positioning himself as, as the front runner. He has, you know, he came out with this big caucus endorsement, uh, you know, 23 or 24 MLA, 24 MLAs, including himself. Yeah. So 23 MLAs, um, you know, Sonia Savage from Calgary, the energy minister is co-chairing his campaign. Chris Warkerton from, from up North, the MP from, uh, from Grand Prairie is, uh, is his other co-chair. Um, you know, he has endorsements from people like Tyler Shandro and Shane Getson, which is kind of a, mixed bag but there's also a whole bunch of other you know ucp mlas with uh, with less offensive political uh, political records uh, uh jonathan who, who have, dennis endorsed, and... endorsed him oh, as well oh well <laughs> there's that's yeah. it game over this is might as well just like give it, to it in everyone else it's uh we don't even need to have the vote on on october 6 jonathan dennis has endorsed Trans he was Davis. there and i was standing beside rick bell while he, uh, jonathan dennis walked by and said he's the real deal i was like oh okay oh that's so, great that's okay. great yeah yeah well so being the establishment candidate you know brings people brings people to support you like like jonathan dennis um uh is he, yeah, is he I mean, the perceived front runner right now? I think so. I think so. And I mean, Taves is a, to give, to give him credit, he does sound like compared to like a number, a lot, compared to a lot of his colleagues in the UCP cabinet, he sounds like an adult when he talks. He doesn't get involved in these kind of weird political games that people like Shandro and Adrian, Adrian Lagrange will get these political games. Um, he's kind of, at least pub, I mean, publicly, so he's publicly kind of stayed out of this stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, he sounds like an adult. He looks like, he looks like he's comfortable wearing a business suit and he looks like he's just as comfortable wearing coveralls and rubber boots on his farm. Uh, so, so, you know, th this is my, you know, he, he, he's, he's not going to look dumb riding a, a horse in the Calgary Stampede Parade. True. I want to, I want to, I want to just say this before we move on to the next one. I, I've, like I said, I've gone to many of the leadership race yeah. announcements and I, I've talked to some of the staffers of these political candidates and I've said, who's your biggest challenge? And they, they talk about some of the candidates and they talk about Taves. And whenever the conversation goes to Taves is as long as Taves shows up without having mud on his shirt, 
then he might actually be a credible candidate. And this is harking back to that leadership launch photo where there was either mud or cow manure or whatever on his uh, shirt. And mm-hmm. the other candidates, staffers, are saying, oh, he's he's disqualified himself because he didn't look professional. Oh, it's like, really? That is, that is such inside baseball. <laughs> Nobody cares. Like, come exactly. on, people. Like, Thank you. It's probably well, a bonus. Like, you know. Yeah, like you said, he looks yeah. like he's comfortable wearing a, a business suit, but looks comfortable wearing a cowboy hat in overalls downtown Calgary. So, yeah, he's yeah. a farmer. Um, yeah. Todd Lowen. I think I, th- I think he's going to be running from Kenny because he is Kenny's cabinet. He is Kenny's finance minister, and he's been yeah. implementing Kenny's agenda. Um, as far as we can tell, happily implementing Kenny's agenda. So there, you know, he's he is open open to to criticism. That on on top of that. Uh, just right around the corner from Grand Prairie Wapiti is uh, Peace River Central Notley, if I'm not mistaken, is the riding. Former, uh, former UCP MLA, former Wild Rose MLA, now turned independent MLA because we're still not sure if he's allowed back into caucus or not because <laughs> Jason Kenny's still there. But Todd Lowen, um, I, what do I say about Todd Lowen? What's your thoughts on Todd, Dave? <laughs> Let's go with that instead. He- you know, he's been running, he's him and him and Drew Barnes have formed this like unaf- this UP- UCP caucus in exile since they were kicked out of the UCP caucus last summer and they've been traveling around the province and and holding meetings and and criticizing Kenny and calling on Kenny to resign. Um, and you know, probably doing everything they can to try to convince another another few UCP MLAs to come sit with them so they can get the funding to form the four MLAs, uh, so they can get the funding to form an official uh, official recognized caucus in the in the legislature. Um, but yeah, I don't, you know, I, I, I I can't, I mean, I can't see him winning. Um, he's, but he's a, he's a, he's like one of those middle packs, isn't he? He's one of those candidates. Yeah. He's going to raise the money. I think he knows people that can probably raise the money. I just don't know where his people go to because they won't go to Taves. They, will they go to Brian Jean? (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, you, you have all these former Wild Rose MLAs who are, uh, who are in the race. And you, you, know, you have to, I have to wonder like whether we're going to reach the point where there's kind of just like this critical mass where there's too many of them and they're going to start to have to drop out and, and endorse people. I can see Taves being on the ballot and, and, you know, he's pro freedom convoy. He's talked about all those issues. He was you pretty, mean big low end, of right? COVID restrictions. Lowen, did I, who did I say? <laughs> you said Taves. I was like, oh no, <laughs> no, not not Taves. Sorry, no, no. I, I meant Lowen. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, Lowen um, uh, is uh, you know he was was supportive of the of the Freedom Convoy and and their initiative, you know what what they stood for. So they're a very you know, and that's a very active you know a very active group uh, politically who you know who did go out and buy memberships to vote against Kenny, and you know they might see that that Lowen was with them. And, you know, along the way, and Lowen might be the one that they, uh, that they support, that they decided to throw their support behind. So I, you know, I, I, I can't see him winning the race. I think that's a bit of a stretch, but uh, he definitely could be a factor in terms of the, you know, if he's able to engage that group. To, the last to one, I, the last candidate I want to talk about a little bit more in depth, then we'll talk mm-hmm. about the last three, even few minutes is yeah. Lila here, former yeah. cabinet minister, got reassigned to the back bench after she uh, openly criticized Jason Kenny and called him for him to resign uh, or step down after Sky Palace Gate or whatever, however we're calling it these days. Um, she is kind of the hidden leadership race in this whole thing, in my opinion, because I, I, I know the campaign manager who is running the campaign and I've said openly to her, I'm a political nerd. If I can't find your leadership announcement on a website or on your social media, it's it's scary. So what's your opinion on where Leela here is going with this leadership race? I, I don't know. Uh, I know I, I watched her, the video of her launch. She talked about how she was running against the machines. Um, and I mean, she that means the, like the political machines. Um, you know, she's a outsider but not really an outsider because she's been a you know she's been a cabinet minister she's still in the UCP caucus she was a a wild another wild rose MLA former wild rose MLA who's who's in this race I don't know where she positions herself I mean she's she's kind of positioned herself as you know trying to be a bit politically moderate she criticized the Kenny government over or criticized Kenny over the Sky Palace patio party she's um you know 
she has a persona as being a nice person who people generally like and is agreeable. Um, but I don't necessarily know that that's really enough to win a leadership race or I, I just don't see where her, I, I, you know, I have to wait to see more. I don't see where her, where her race is, where her campaign is going. And I just want to make sure everyone remembers she was the former deputy leader of the United Conservative Party under Jason Kenney and former deputy leader of the Wild Rose under Brian Jean. So she's been the second person for a few, few people here. Um, yeah. The last two that have officially announced and officially announced, and I, I, I don't want to take much time on them because I didn't know about them before this whole thing. And that's Rebecca Schultz, the Minister of Children's mm -hmm. Services, and Rajon Swanee, who is the former Minister of Transportation, then former Minister of Children's Services as well, before getting shuffled into transportation. What's Rajon's, uh, Rajon is Northeast, uh, Rebecca's down South. What's your thoughts on these two? Because when I went to their leadership race, the first thing they said was, I was at the cabinet table, but I wasn't making the decisions at the cabinet <laughs> table. And I went, wait, what? So what? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, this, this, this is the whole, you know, I was there, but, but I was really, I was, I was, I, was, I was with them, but I was really against them kind of thing. It's the, you know, you, I think you're going to see a lot of this in, uh, in this leadership race is, is candidates trying to reinvent the, you know, rewrite, rewrite the history of, of, uh, or their, their, their part in the history of, of Jason Kenney's UCP cabinet, um, you know, and they will be varying degrees of success. I think these two candidates are actually ones to watch. And I think they're quite really? interesting. I, yeah, I do. I think, I think Rajan Sani, I think, you know, she's not a very well-known political name. She doesn't come from a political background, but uh, from what I hear, she's well respected in uh, in ca among her cabinet colleagues. Um, a, a year ago, when I was asking MLAs uh, around, you know, who or who should I be watching? Who do you think? Who are you watching? Who do you think I should be watching? Aside from the obvious people who might run for the UCP leadership, they said, yeah, you know, what? keep an eye on on Rajan Sani and see, you know, she's she's an up and comer in cabinet. She's seen seen as fairly competent um, and people like her uh you know she doesn't have a political machine behind her like i mean political machine is and she doesn't have like it's not like she has years of experience in conservative political circles in this province she's a new new uh, yeah. a newer candidate um i think she's she you know i think she could be very add, add a very interesting dynamic to the race she could be one to watch and i, I would say the same with uh, with rebecca schultz who is you know speaking of a, new pe new people to alberta yeah, politics only new, being here for seven years <laughs> yeah i moved, moved from from saskatchewan in i think 2015 or 2016 with her with her with her husband um the uh uh so new, new to alberta i don't know how much that i don't know how much that matters i mean i think that if she ends up being a contender i think we'll hear her opponents talk about it a lot um but i don't i don't necessarily think it, you know a lot of people are new to alberta yeah um and she has some she big has some names packing, backing yeah. her as well. Brad Wall, Tim McMillan, yeah. former president of uh, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, uh, Stephanie Cussey, uh, Pierre Polyev's mother was at the event that was at, uh, okay. in Southern. <laughs> uh, well, because Dan McLean was there yeah. and Councillor McLean yeah. uh, works with his brother. So the Polyev, Polyev campaign would probably might be down there. And uh, Leela, uh, Lila, Lila Goodridge, former- Lila Goodridge? Yeah, uh, MP for Fort McMurray, Cold yeah. Lake. Yeah, so she's backing uh, Rebecca as well. So she has some yeah. names and Jason Copping, uh, Nixon, uh, Jeremy Nixon, and I forget her name from Medicine Hat. Mika Michaela Frey, Michaela Frey from Medicine yeah. Hat. So she has, Medicine Hat. Yeah, she I, has I, I think she, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, I think she's, uh, I think she, the, the, those two are going to be interesting candidates to watch because I think they are, they have, I, I think, they have the potential to tap into some um, uh, uh, some politics, or I don't reword 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 what I'm saying. I think they 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 have the potential to be players in this race. I think they're not very well known. Uh, they're not very well known to most Albertans because they're both first term MLAs, and they're not like they're not they weren't the cabinet ministers that you hear about all the time. You don't really hear about the minister of transportation, and you don't necessarily hear a lot about. The Minister of Children's Services a lot. You, you know, yeah. she had a, the announcement with the ten, with the ten dollar a day childcare funding from the feds. But aside from that, I don't think you really hear a lot of hear a lot about them. Um, you know, especially during COVID, the, right? During COVID, especially during COVID. Yeah. So I think the endorsements that that uh, that Schultz is has received is are notable, um, and that leads me to think that she might have some political organization behind her. 
um, you know, if people like Brad Wall and Ron Ambrose and, you know, the, the list of people oh, that you yeah. named are, are willing to step out and endorse this first term MLA from, from South Calgary. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, that she might be a player in this race and might be one to watch. She's kind of the, she, I mean, I think you're going to see these candidates try to position themselves as like the insider's outsider, you know? So it's, you know, she wasn't, they weren't, they're not like, they're not like Jason Kenny style people who've been around for, you know, in politics, floating around politics for 30 years. Uh, but they're, you know, they, they have experience in cabinet, but they're still kind of, they can, they're going to try to position themselves as outsiders because they're, they're newish to, to Alberta politics. Last candidate before we wrap here, and that is the candidate who has announced, but not officially announced that she might be seeking, but potentially looking at seeking the nomination. And that is the other white knight that Alberta politics so desperately need after Jason Kenney and Jim <laughs> Prentice coming from Ottawa, Miss Michelle Rempel Gardner. Um, what's your thoughts on another federal MP coming to Alberta to try and save us from those nasty, nasty NDP, as they always try to say? <laughs> well, I mean, it, it's a uh, f- federal MPs don't have a great track record jumping into, uh, d- jumping into, uh, into provincial politics in Alberta. I'm not going to, not to discount Michelle uh, Rempel Garner. Um, she might be able to break that. Um, but I, you know, I don't know, like Jason Kenney and like Jim Prentice, uh, there's a lot of unknowns in terms of, you know, she's a prominent MP in Ottawa and, you know, a prominent critic, but, you know, no one really knows where she might stand on issues provincially in Alberta. And, and you know, the difference between going to Ottawa, gov- going to Ottawa and even governing in Ottawa is, is a much different political beast than governing provincially, especially in a, in a province like Alberta, um, where, you know, you're making decisions that are not, 30,000 feet above and high level stuff. It's, it's stuff that impacts people's day-to-day things. And, and, you know, I, I wonder about these, pol- sometimes I wonder about politicians who've been around, you know, for a long time, but yet you still don't really, you don't really know them. Um, so, you know, I think she, but I think she, I mean, I think she'd be a, she'd, she'd bring a, she'd be a big name in the race. She'd probably bring some support um, federally. She'd be able to raise the 150,000 like that, probably. Oh, abso- absolutely. Yeah, no, no, I don't think money would be an issue. Um, and, uh, you know, she might be, if she jumps in, she might be Calgary's candidate. Um, yeah. You know, and I've noticed she's tried to, you know, she's, it seems like she's tried in the past year or so, she's tried to kind of reinvent herself a little bit, be a little more political, moderate. She's not, you know, jumping on all the Greek political grievance bandwagons like she was in, in the years past and you know that she'd really defined herself as as kind of like a culture warrior in a way um you know I think the Buffalo Declaration thing is what is probably going to raise some eyebrows you know this kind of pseudo separatism thing well in um, this race when you have Brian Jean and uh, Daniel Smith talk about separation and autonomy everything's I, well, fair I'm- game <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm, but I'm not sure there's much, is there much room left for it? Like, I mean, oh, great. It's just another candidate who thinks Alberta should be, you know, like South Tyrol or, you That's know, be it autonomous. Like, oh, great. Um, no, anyway, I don't want to, I don't want to, I obviously downplay her. She'll be a big, she'll be, she will be a big name if she enters the race and she'll be a credible candidate and she'll no doubt raise the money. And uh, she might be the and, Pierre. And that's where I'm thinking. She, she, might, might. Be, yeah, she, she might be the people that brings the large crowds out to attend the, her rallies. I could be wrong. Yeah. Always have to be she, disproven. Yeah, and I think the lesson and, and the lesson for that, I mean, Jason Kenney did the same thing. He was able to bring people out to the rallies. And I think that the lesson, one of the lessons you can we can learn from Jason Kenney is that he may be an extremely talented campaigner <clears throat> and he may be really good at politics, but he's really bad at governing. And he's, you know, none of that translated, none of that magic that, that you know, led him to create the, 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 uh, the United Conservative Party and, you know, the Canadian Taxpayer Federation, all the, that, like that, yeah. none of that, none of that, like, it didn't seem to mean anything, because once he entered the premier's office, it was just a giant hot mess from day one, almost. So, That's you know, true. being in opposition doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be a good, uh, going to be a good, uh, uh, a good premier. True. That. I, think it's just, I, think it's, I think it's a lesson. It's a lesson that someone can, someone somewhere can learn. <laughs> Well, I said 45 minutes. We're at almost past the hour. We're actually past the hour mark. Um, <laughs> Dave, I want to thank you so much for doing this. I'm, uh, I, I asked Dave beforehand, and uh, is it Dave or David? Like, does it you matter? Call me Dave. Call me Dave. It, okay, because I, I, your email's David. I was like, okay, am I calling yes. them wrong this entire time? So, um, my, my, birth, my birth name is David. Okay, but I can call you <laughs> Dave. Good. Um, yes. I, I asked. 
Dave before we came on if he wanted to come back on throughout the summer or potentially if he has time with his busy schedule and work life as well. Uh, he has said that he if he there's possibly an opening he can possibly come back on to talk about this because he likes talking about politics and uh, it's always great to have uh, Dave on the show to talk about this and the leadership race during this next few months is going to be quite interesting to see especially after debate so Dave I want to thank you so much for doing this. Where can people find you? Uh, uh, you can find me at uh, daveberta.ca. I have a substack that I'm starting at some point in the future at daveberta.substack.com. So please feel free to go sign up there. And uh, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, a lot of fun talking politics with you today, Chris. And uh, I'll look forward to joining you again over the summer if you have it. Uh, uh, well, always, always, always. We might actually add a few more political comments. We'll, we'll see if we can get Eric Grenier and yourself on an episode and just really oh, be geek excellent. out. Great. <laughs> yes, yeah, he is. Totally. Um, so with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brand. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, get it from behind the social media for at least five minutes. Go have a conversation with somebody because it actually does help our society and our democracy be better. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, guys, keep talking. <laughs>